Hello, hello. And hi, 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 everybody. Welcome to another edition of Things We Said Today. This is a Beatles talk show, a bi-weekly show, in which we talk about anything that has to do with the Beatles. Their years together, their years apart, what happened way in the past, what's happening today, and everything in between. And I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the regular co-hosts of this show. And uh, I hope that you know me for my other Beatles programs, a syndicated Beatles show called Every Little Thing, and also another podcast show which is strictly on the solo Beatles called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. And I'm being joined by my two regular co-hosts on this show. First of all, a man who has written a couple of Beatle books, one called From the Cavern to the Rooftop, the other Got That Something, How the Beatles I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything. He's also a freelance writer for the Wall Street Journal and other publications, spent many years at the New York Times in their classical department, and currently working on uh, several volumes of a McCartney biography, and uh, that's Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken, and hello, everyone. My other co-host, and he'll be very impressed that I know this, just celebrated his 37th anniversary on New York's WFUV. I know that because I listened to his show when he was celebrating just a couple of days ago. Did which, I mention uh, it? Yeah. I forgot. I mentioned it? I... Huh. <laughs> yes, you did. I, I don't uh-huh. remember. Someone yeah. will always, I'll get an email. Hey, I love that song you played. I'm like, you got to help me here. I don't remember. I forget mm. 10 minutes after I play them or open my mouth and say it. Well, very often I catch uh, Darren show if I'm in the car and I can pick it up if uh, the reception's good. And uh, I stumbled upon his show a couple of days ago and loved the music he was playing. Played a lot of good stuff on there. Although they cut off George Harrison at the end, which he had nothing to do with. Uh, did it? Really? Well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you had If Not For You. They were playing If Not For yeah. You and then it went into that the next. That is actually, I'm glad you mentioned that. That's a little bit of a, uh, one, I guess, the, one of the negatives about the fact that we're all broadcasting from remotely. Mm. And I guess... Uh, you know, not not being totally tech savvy when it comes to how this is working. But I think that has something to do with the fact that the program be after at four o'clock, you, the, the time is very important. And if the timing's not dead on, then the computer goes, you know, and the hard drives all go bluey. Um, mm. So I didn't realize that happened. But, yeah, I think that does that probably does happen more times than I'm aware of, like at, on Saturdays at four or you know, when they have to make a transition, I don't think that's I think I don't think it's avoidable, uh, but it's unfortunate. But, it, you know, I think we got we kind of have to. That's what happens when everything's being controlled remotely. Hmm. I just wanted to free you of any possible guilt on on that level in case anybody was listening. But uh, yeah. <laughs> I did not do that. <laughs> but uh, congratulations but, yeah. on your milestone there. That's quite an accomplishment. Yes. Uh, February 26th. 1984, the first show was on FEUV. Of course, the station's changed uh, entirely since then. The only really thing that's the same is the name. And there was a period technically in late, I guess, late 1990, when I technically wasn't an active part of the station. I was sort of around and would get called on if they needed somebody to jump in and run the board for a day. Or I filled in once for a week right at Christmas 90. That mm. led to them hiring me. It's a long story, but yeah, it's 37 years almost almost straight through at WFUV. Yeah, I've been there. That, when you're new, that, when you're new, they give you Christmas and they give you New Year's Eve. <laughs> <laughs> you get stuck I, with it. That might have been the last Christmas I ever worked because I always take the holidays off. And mm. maybe there was one one year I couldn't uh, get the days that I wanted, but. That when I was filled in for the morning DJ in '90, uh, that may have been the last Christmas week I worked on the air, and maybe the first too. Actually, come to think of it, I've been fortunate with that, mm. getting the holidays off. Anyway, thank you for the congratulations, and here's to another. I'm going to add a hundred. Here's to another 137 more years on <laughs> WFUV. <laughs> All right, we have uh, a special theme for our show at this time and it has to do with a dream bbc compilation 
that uh, each of us has put together. And I'll explain more about that a little bit later on. I also want to acknowledge a couple of things as a few things we haven't addressed here on the show news-wise, one of which is the, the brand new Bob Dylan uh, release of music that he recorded in 1970, which has a lot of stuff of him rehearsing with George Harrison, and also the recent Plastic on All Band book, which is absolutely wonderful. We're going to be talking about that probably, well, within our next few shows, definitely. So those of you who might have been wondering, why have we put that off? In actual fact, where the Plastic Ono Band book is concerned, we were going to talk about that when the box set was going to come out, and we thought it was going to be uh, a bit earlier, but uh, it has been pushed back a few months, as most of you already know. But we will tackle you know, both those releases fairly soon, so hang tight for those. In the meantime, as usual, we have uh, Beatle news to get to, and actually quite a bit more than in our last few shows. In our last show, we announced that according to one source, ClassicBands.com, the Plastic Auto Band box set would be coming out April 16th. We can now make it official, as it's even been given that date on the Plastic Auto Band website. March 4th is the date we've been told to pay attention to the website. Most likely, it'll be the first day you can pre-order the box set. So, pencil in the date. The Plastic Auto Band box set is due out April the 16th. Also, for all of you who are collectors, my two co-hosts are, there is a Target exclusive for John Lennon's Give Me Some Truth, which just came out in opaque blue. Did either of you get it? Mm -mm. You know, I, we didn't we make mention of this late last year? Yes, we did. Uh, but yeah, you now know, it's officially out. We forgot about it, so uh, I'm glad I listened to this show. I'm going to make a note <laughs> right here. Opaque. The vinyl, uh, <laughs> some truth, opaque, and it's Target. Yes. Now, yes, sir. But, but I'm going to file a complaint in this in this section here. Uh, I, I got I didn't get it immediately, but at some point I think right before the holidays, I ordered "Give Me Some Truth" on vinyl from Amazon, and dang nubbit, it came unsealed. It was an unsealed box. Did anyone else? order give me some truth on vinyl and get a box that was not sealed now i looked online and i found photos and a, one or two videos here or there where i was mainly looking to see if they were sealed they were i was very angry uh and uh not that i did anything about it but i just thought i'd share that my copy came unsealed of the vinyl box set mm. as you are <laughs> okay making the news in a big way on social media is a forthcoming book from Paul McCartney and editor Paul Mundoon called The Lyrics 1956 to the Present. In its press release, Paul is quoted as saying, more often than I can count, I've been asked if I would write an autobiography, but the time has never been right. The one thing I've always managed to do, whether at home or on the road, is to write new songs. I know that some people, when they get to a certain age, like to go to a diary to recall day-to-day -day events from the past, but I have no such notebooks. What I do have are my songs, hundreds of them, which I've learned serve much the same purpose. And these songs span my entire life, end of quote. The press release goes on to say, in this extraordinary book, with unparalleled candor, Paul McCartney recounts his life and art through the prism of 154 songs from all stages of his career, from his earliest boyhood compositions through the legendary decade of the Beatles to Wings and his solo albums to the present, arranged alphabetically to provide a kaleidoscopic rather than chronological account. It establishes definitive texts of the song's lyrics for the first time and describes the circumstances in which they were written, the people and places that inspired them, and what he thinks of them now. Presented with this is a treasure trove of material from McCartney's personal archive, drafts, letters, photographs, never seen before, which make this also a unique visual record of one of the greatest songwriters of all time. We learn intimately about the man, the creative process, the working out of melodies, the moments of inspiration, the voice and personality of Paul McCartney sings off every page. I wish I could have written this. There has never been a book about a great musician like it, and it's due out November the 2nd. It looks to be a two-volume book, 
put in a slip case. Each book has approximately 480 pages. Amazon US is now taking pre-orders and asking $100 for it. Amazon UK is asking 66 pounds. Um, I want to congratulate the person who wrote that for using kaleidoscopic in that press release. I always thought kaleidoscopic was a medical procedure, but uh, <laughs> clearly not. Um, but uh, anyway, yeah, you mentioned a hundred dollars. Uh, I guess we were going to go on to say what popped into, uh, onto Amazon today, the day we record the show and is now gone. Yeah. It was selling for at least since, uh, yesterday, uh, for $60 briefly. And now it's going for 90, you told me, right, Darren? Yeah. As we- also, uh, Steve Marinucci's Beatles News and Information page is reporting that Paul and Ringo will be appearing on a virtual Grammy Award benefit show. Every year, a few days before the Grammy Awards, the Royal Academy's Music Cares hosts a star-studded invitation-only benefit gala saluting its person of the year. This year, because of the pandemic, it's been replaced by a virtual benefit called Music on a Mission, which will be a ticketed event that anyone can enjoy. The fundraiser will be held Friday, March 12th, two days before the Grammy ceremonies, and will feature special appearances from Paul, Ringo, Lionel Richie, Carol King, Mick Fleetwood, and other artists, as well as live and archival performances. Tickets are $25, and can be purchased at musiccares.org. That's M-U-S-I-C-A-R-E-S. So there's one C in there. Dot org. Since it began, Music Cares has distributed more than $22 million to help more than 25,000 industry people, from songwriters, musicians, and engineers, to bus drivers, guitar techs, record label employees, and more. This year's Grammy Awards takes place Sunday, March 14th in Los Angeles, and will air on CBS. And speaking of the Grammys, Rolling Stone is reporting that in March, the Grammy Museum will be featuring a virtual Ringo Star program. It's a virtual exhibit and interviews with Ringo. On March the 4th, this week, the museum will release an interview with Ringo from 2010 from their Live from the Vault series, and that'll be followed by a new interview with the museum's founding executive director, Bob Santelli, on March 18th. Ringo will discuss his upcoming EP, Zoom In, and his new book, Ringo Rocks, 30 Years of the All-Stars, 1989 to 2019. In addition, the museum will feature the 2013 exhibit, Peace and Love, virtually. It covers his early life in Liverpool, his launch to superstardom with the Beatles, and his years with his All-Star band. The museum's streaming service, Collection Live, can be accessed at watch.grammymuseum.com. Dot org. And don't forget Ringo's new EP, Zoom In, comes out March the 19th. I was lucky enough to see that um, uh, exhibition in 2013 in L.A. It was totally complete accident. I just happened to be with my family on a brief trip out west to visit some folks that we knew. And um, I don't remember if I even knew that the exhibition was happening. It, it was, was getting a, a lot of attention. I know it was publicized I a lot. Didn't I probably did know it was happening, but never thought it would fit into our schedule, which was pretty quick, literally 24 hours in L.A. before we went out, headed out to uh, Las Vegas and San Diego. And it worked out beautifully because I got to spend a couple of hours in Amoeba Records. And at some point, realized that the Grammy Museum was part of the building that's the Staples Center. Mm-hmm. And it all just fell beautifully into place. The Ringo exhibition, you know, so it was a Darren Fest that Saturday before we hit the road and headed uh, to uh, Las Vegas to see Love. That was the uh, purpose of that part of the trip. So, wow. but it was a terrific exhibition. And what so, were I, the, what were the highlights for you? What kind of memorabilia, or, or you know? Well, I mean, I'm, I mean, just seeing the, like the, 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 his real drum kit, seeing. You know, the clothes, the suit that he wore, the suits, mm-hmm. um, I, I, you know, it just ble- kind of it's now eight, it's going to be eight years this summer. Uh, so I don't remember all the details anymore. But, you know, it just was a very, very well done. Uh, and it was manageable in so much that, it, you know, it was not like a huge museum. It was part of uh, of uh, of the Grammy Museum. And uh, it just was something I don't think I had figured into the trip. It just worked out 
beautifully. So, uh, um, so I look forward to seeing what they, uh, if they, you know, how much of 2013 they kind of show in this uh, new event that's happening uh, this month. Well, I don't know how different it'll be from the from the peace and love event from eight years ago. It might be the same, but it'd be nice if they added stuff. So we'll see. For those of us who I will be, I, was, I hmm? assume that I'll recognize things if you know they did. I'm sure you say images of um, of some of the items that they had on display in 2013. Um, I would think they would have to, uh, and it would be it would be a shame if they didn't because it was it was really well done and it was really cool. Mm. Okay. Well, in the latest issue of Beetle Fan Magazine, Ringo told Martha DeBale that he thinks that his rescheduled tour for 2021 is not going to happen because of the pandemic. Ringo says, there's nothing we can do about it. I have to get over that. I want to play. The tour has not been officially canceled yet, but a source told Beetle Fan, the band were told it's on, but subject to each theater's state and local guidelines. Yeah, we're all waiting to hear about that because I have tickets for uh, Tanglewood in June. And so I yeah. hope it doesn't get canceled, I, but I, it wouldn't surprise me. Tanglewood's outdoors, correct? Yes. I have a feeling that the outdoor gigs like they're doing uh, or I think will be doing, the outdoor gigs may go on. Uh, but again, of course, I don't know how they'll handle, you know, if, if the Tanglewood event was, say, sold out or close to sold out. Mm. I don't know if they can handle that kind of capacity in 2021 with uh, with social distancing and whatnot. I have tickets for the Beacon Theater shows. Yeah. <laughs> and the Beacon Theater often just struck me as the type of place where viruses go to thrive. Uh, so I, I, I'm not holding out hope that the, uh, the Beacon shows are going to happen in June. I think the dates were very close to the original ones in 2020. He was yeah. They rescheduled right away and got almost the same three dates pretty close mm. so but i'm not holding out much hope for that if there was a way that he could delay it later in the year i think he will have a shot but i don't know how any of that works mm. i'd really shoot for the fall i really don't think it's going to happen but time will tell we will know we will know soon enough okay and uh some more news here. Rolling Stone reports that another special edition George Harrison turntable is being sold by the audio brand Project, and it's available now for under $500. You might recall that this first debuted when Project teamed up with the Universal Music Group, and only 2,500 of these turntables were made. This limited run can play at both 33 and 45 RPM. It comes with an Ortofon cartridge along with an acrylic platter and detailed artwork from Shepard Ferry and Studio One. You can connect the turntable to your speakers with gold-plated RCA cables. Rolling Stone also says this special edition isn't the only model curated with rock and roll fans in mind. The company also sells the Beatles Sgt. Pepper Essential 3 record player, also the Essential 3 digital turntable, in addition to Record Master, that's built with a USB port to connect to your devices. There you go. With all your collector's items, Alan, Darren, that, that'll be just very suitable. Get the George Harrison turntable. I tell you, those turntables, because there was others that they put out as well, Beetle-themed, and uh, you know they're all very tempting, but I held back. Mm. You can put all your m copies of McCartney 3 on there. <laughs> Buy a turntable Stack them one on top of each other. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there you go. Okay, for the Beatle collector who must have everything, like Alan and Darren, on February the 2nd, the entire collection of the TV show Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In came out as a box set on DVD of 37 discs. Ringo made an appearance on January the 27th, 1970, to promote his new movie, The Magic Christian. The list price on Amazon is $159.99, and, as I, when I last looked, selling for $69.96. This is on Time Life, but there is also a box set that came out in 2018 that was also the complete series. The new book, Fandom and the Beatles, by Ken Womack and Kid O'Toole, is now available as a Kindle version. Kid hasn't been told yet when the hardback and paperback versions will be coming out, but you can pre-order it right now on Kindle on, uh, on Amazon. Okay, we mourn the loss of the Beatles' accountant, Harry Pinsker 
He worked for them from 1962 to 1970, overseeing their tax affairs, setting up their companies, helping them to buy their homes, and even handling their grocery bills. Paul McCartney was quoted as saying, Harry was the only one who really knew what went on. It is said he helped to inspire George Harrison to write the song Tax Man, and he tried to persuade John Lennon not to pose nude on the album cover for Two Virgins with Yoko. He was also given the task of informing the Beatles in 1964 that they were officially millionaires, but he also had to tell them that their millions were in earnings, not assets, and that they needed to set aside some of those earnings for taxes. Harry was 90 years old. All right, hmm. news news on cover versions of songs. In our last show, I mentioned that the great husband and wife duo of Marilyn McCoo and Billy Davis Jr. have just covered the Paul McCartney and Wings classic, Silly Love Songs, but I didn't know more about it. The two of them were on the CBS Morning News this weekend, and it was revealed that they just made a new album of all songs written by Lennon and McCartney called Blackbird Lennon McCartney Icons. Now, I haven't seen a track listing yet, but Amazon says it'll be coming out April the 30th, and they have it listed for streaming and as an MP3. No physical product as of yet. And I can assure you, you know, those two, even up there in age, in their upper 70s, they can sing up a storm. Their their vocals are so strong to this day. Uh, I would highly recommend getting this album. You can get to hear online their version of Blackbird, which is really nice. The one thing I'm kind of confused about, they keep saying Lennon McCartney, so it makes me think that it's Lennon McCartney songs from the Beatles only. But apparently this new recording of Silly Love Songs, I've only found out about, and it should be on there, so it could include Lennon solo or McCartney solo. I think so anyway. But we'll find out more as we go along. Ken, I found out a little more information on the Marilyn McCoo and Billy Davis Jr. album now. Uh, this is just one place on the Internet where I found the album. Newberry Comics is selling the album on CD. So physical format, at least in the form of CDs, are being made. Uh, mm. And Newberry Comics, at least what I'm looking at, is selling the CDs autographed by Marilyn McCoo and Billy Davis Jr., uh, limited to per customer uh, the release date, uh, April 30th, uh, so I guess you could pre-order now, sixteen ninety nine, And they do list 10 songs uh, on the album. Okay, uh, so you want to read um, them? I guess I, we can assume that these, this is the tr- like a final track listing and not some inaccurate, you know. Oh, album opens with Got to Get You Into My Life, featuring Yancey. The second track is The Fool on the Hill, featuring Natalie Hannah Mendoza. I don't know who they are. I'm not sure. Number three, Blackbird, Mm -hmm. uh, which is technically the title track. Number four, Yesterday. Number five, Ticket to Ride. Six, The Long and Winding Road. Seven, Silly Love Songs. Okay. Number eight, Help. The ninth track featuring James Gadsden is just like starting over. And the album ends with And I Love Her. Okay. So so Newberry Comics website. All right. Thank you for... uh for finding that out for us, our, our sleuth here, Darren DeVivo. Yeah, because I was, was able... looking at Amazon and, and nothing, and then I did a Google search. I'm like, they've been on national television. There's got to be something online about buying this album. Mm. You know, the first thing that I stumbled upon was Newbury Comics website. Okay, very good. So there's eight Beatles songs, and there's one solo each from, from John and Paul. That's Yep, that's what it looks like here, and I'm trying to see if I can find out a little more, but as of right now, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's the deal. Okay, very good. Thank you, Darren. Okay, mm. uh, right there, you know, on the move, on the ball, Darren DeVivo. Former frontman for The Verb, Richard Ashcroft, has just recorded a cover of John Lennon's Bring On the Lucy, Free to People. John's recording of the song appeared on his Mind Games album. Ashcroft recorded John's song partly at Abbey Road Studios and also at Red Tone Studios in East Palo Alto, California, thanks to both Dylan Seavey and James Bell for this information. Really cool to hear that. I always get a big kick when people cover songs that are not commonly done, and Bring On the Lucy is one of those songs. Guitar great Steve Lukather just released a new album called I Found the Sun Again, which contains the one song he recorded with Ringo on drums, Run to Me. 
which had previously been released digitally. A CD and transparent double blue album will be available through Amazon and Bull Moose, as well as a digital version of the album. So there you go. Another colored vinyl album for you to collect. Our friend Jeff Slate has just released a cover version of the Traveling Wilburys Handle with Care with his band, The Weekend Wilburys, which is available now for purchase. And you can find a video of him and his band doing the song on YouTube. Pretty faithful to the original. The guy in the band that does uh, George's sly guitar work does a great job on it. Jeff Slate with The Weekend Wilburys. And the group The Gold Needles have just released a new album called What's Tomorrow Ever Done For You, in which they cover George Harrison's If I Needed Someone. A new video for their cover is now on YouTube. A few more news items on the Billboard album charts. I thought I'd mention this because it was a big leap for the Beatles' one album, which went from 75 to 48 after 460 weeks on the charts. Chances are, if there's ever a Beatles album on the charts, in the top 200, it's going to be the Beatles one. It always hangs in there. But that was a nice leap for them in the past week. Um, also, we should say happy birthday to Yoko Ono, who turned 88 years young. On February the 18th, Yoko posted this message online. Thank you for all your beautiful birthday messages. 88 years young. Lots of love, Yoko. That's why I had to say young, because she said it too. But quite a <laughs> blessing. Every day is a blessing when you're up there in age. And uh, so grateful she's still with us. Okay. And uh, that's all the news I have for you this time. So we move on now to our main topic for the show. And as I said earlier, we're putting together our own dream BBC compilation. This is an idea that I came up with. And I was imagining, let's just say we were all living back in the 60s and we had no idea what was going to happen in the future. We had no idea that a compilation would come out in 1994, live at the BBC, and then another one on air. It was, we're still in the 60s and the record company EMI decides, you know what? These BBC recordings are pretty good. They're worth putting out. And they had access to all of the BBC recordings. And they wanted to put together an album. Now, most Beatles albums, as you know, were usually 14 tracks. I know A Hard Day's Night was 13, but in general, go with 14. So if you could put together your own BBC compilation of what you think are the best, the choicest tracks of what the Beatles did on BBC radio, what would they be? And actually, when I when I wrote to uh, Alan and Darren about this, I, I said there really are no rules here. They could be any 14 tracks that you want them to be. In my logic, it would only make sense that you would you would make them all songs that the Beatles did not release for EMI. And they did 36 songs for BBC Radio that they didn't release in their regular catalog with EMI. So I would think that if you put out a compilation with 14 songs that hadn't come out before, that would be a far more attractive package than another version of a song that they already released. But Alan and Darren can include any songs they want to. It's their choice. There are no rules. Like I said, you don't have to make this like a typical Beatles album. It doesn't have to be mainly John and Paul doing vocals with two George and one Ringo. If you want it to be all John, <laughs> it's whatever you want it to be. If you had your way and you could put together your own, if it's the 60s, it's one album, it's 14 tracks, what would you do? So I pose this to Alan and to Darren, and, uh, and all three of us have compiled our own album of 14 songs. And if you want to throw in an honorable mention here and there, that's okay too. And this is not necessarily in the same order as it would be on the album. We're just picking the 14 songs that we feel would be the best or would make the best compilation. So why don't we start with Alan? Okay. Um, first, um, I thought that there was a rule in that it was supposed to be based on the um, two compilations that EMI put out. And then um, we talked about it this morning, that it was sort of too late to go back to, you know, the, the, the best 
bootleg compilation of BBC stuff that brings together really the best best sounding versions of everything we have is a 24 disc set um, mm -hmm. put out by Lord Reith in um, a few years ago. And um, uh, he was upgrading it again in 2019, but never finished. So we'll see what happens with that. But that was, you know, that was like, that's a lot to listen to. And um, also, since we don't know whether the listeners have that uh, necessarily, um, but do have access probably to the two EMI compilations, which are four discs together, um, mm. I ended up just going with stuff that was on there. So we miss things like, you know, Dream Baby from the first appearance that has Pete Best on it. But that sort of leads to the, the second problem I ran into is that with, you know, 36 songs to choose from and multiple takes, I mean, even on the two EMI sets, there were, there were some repeats uh, from between the first and second. If you have only 14 tracks, you're going to have to leave out an awful lot of good stuff. So the 14 I chose, and I put them in like roughly the running order, I think that would, you know, make a fun album, but it, it doesn't have to be, and I'm not really an A&R guy, you know. So uh, I began with Soldier of Love, partly because it's my favorite of their BBC tracks or with, within the top few favorites. I think it's also it also would be a good album opener. John singing, uh, it's the only performance of that song we have of, of them. And uh, so that's the start. Uh, the next one was Some Other Guy. Uh, well... Soldier of Love was from July 1663. I figure I'll give the dates too. Uh, Some Other Guy from Easy Beat on June 23rd, 1963. Some Other Guy, just because we know it was an important song to them. Um, you know, John, as late as, you know, the time Instant Karma came out, referred to it as, you know, uh, the thing that he sort of ripped off the opening of Instant Karma from. Uh, now that could have been because around that time uh, when they were putting together that Man of the Decade special, or I think it was that, it might have been another another special involving him, uh, he sat in a, a, a video suite and, and saw the clip possibly for the first time since they recorded it. But in any case, um, and you know, we have the video uh, from the cavern. Uh, this, in some ways, to me, is a stronger performance than that. Uh, so, I, I, I thought it, you know, it was important to them. It was a good rocker. Um, I focused largely on rockers, not entirely, but uh, largely. So that's that's the second one. The third one, um, "Too Much Monkey Business" from Pop Go the Beatles, September tenth, nineteen sixty three. Um, I've got a bunch of uh, Chuck Berry in here, not all of the Chuck Berry they did. I think there's probably enough to do almost a, a Beatles do Chuck Berry on the BBC if you, if you used mm -hmm. all of them. But Too Much Monkey Business is, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a good track. I, I like the way they do it. And then sliding towards a, a sort of different area, I Got a Woman from Pop Go the Beatles, August 13th, 63. It's another John vocal. These are, I guess these are all John vocals, but I think he does a, a pretty good job with that. They, that's a, a song they performed a bunch on the BBC. So I, I think it, it rated a, a place here. Uh, Keep Your Hands Off My Baby, uh, mm. January 26, 63. It's just a, another track that, you know, I think they do a good job with and you you know, it, it's not on any of their albums. And, uh, of course, that's true of all of these. But, um, okay. Now I have a, a, a little, very little country section, um, sort of in deference to our guest from last uh, episode. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, so I've got Short of Fall from uh, Pop Go the Beatles, June 18th, 63. And Crying, Waiting, Hoping uh, from August 6th, 1963, also a Pop Go the Beatles episode. Those two, I think, seem to go together well. They recorded them a few times each, I think. Uh, Ringo then did a, a solo cover of Short of Fall later. And uh, 
I just think that, you know, if, if we're going to look at some of the Beatles country stuff, those are, those are two good examples. Almost had, I forgot to remember to forget in there, but it ended up having to move out because I wanted something else and <laughs> was really trying to keep to this 14 song limit. Next one is to know her is to love her. You know, we do have the DECA recording of it, but um, I actually like this one better. Uh, this is from another Pop Go the Beatles show on August 663, same show as Crying, Waiting, Hoping. And again, it's John. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's a good song and um, they do it well, so it, it seemed to rate a place here. Hippie, hippie shake. Hippie, hippie shake. I could have left it out, except that, you know, that was a song that they recorded, you know, 18 gazillion times for the BBC. It seemed to have been, you know, a, a really uh, big part of their live set in the early days. And, uh, you know, it gives them a chance to do a bit of screaming and uh, carrying on. So I, I thought maybe it should be there. It's from Pop Go the Beatles on July 30th, 63. Next is, uh, you know, I guess we're back to Chuck Berry, aren't we? I'm talking about you. Mm -hmm. Chuck Berry's one. And that is from Saturday Club, March 16th, 63. You know, a lot of those songs, uh, you know, talking about you, keep your hands off my baby, too much monkey business, just have a lot of energy. And, you know, a lot of that is, you know, because of John. I mean, he, he, he was really into these tracks and, uh, you know, gave it great performance. And then yet another Chuck Berry, the, uh, I guess, classic Chuck Berry, Johnny Be Good, live on February 15th, 64. That's the only 64 track I have in here from Saturday Club. And then we let Paul do a bit more screaming, having heard, uh, you know, hippie hippie shake. Uh, I have Oh My Soul, a little richer cover, um, mm -hmm. August 27th, 63. Now, that was sort of a, a tough one because I kind of wanted to include Lucille, kind of wanted to include Clarabella. But I thought both of those songs are, you know, probably better known than Oh My Soul. And uh, Oh My Soul does a lot of the same things as they do. Um, so I figured, you know, with this album, there's going to be a lot of clamoring for a volume two. I would save Lucille and Clarabella <laughs> for volume two. The second to last track is Don't Ever Change. It's a little bit of a, you know, teeny bobberish song, I think, maybe, but they do it real well. And also these songs that I've picked so far doesn't have an awful lot of vocal harmony and that does. And I wanted that aspect in here too. It's a pretty tune. Listen to it again, you know, trying to persuade myself not to include it, but I just kind of wanted it in there. And last, but definitely not least, the only Lennon McCartney song they did on the BBC that they never recorded in the, you know, for EMI in the studio, I'll be on my way. Um, mm -hmm. I suspect they didn't like I'll be on my way that much themselves. Uh, you know, they gave it away. I think was it Billy J. Kramer? Yep. And um, it, it does, you know, there, there used to be when people used to write about the Lennon McCartney songwriting team and how good they were, they always would say things like, you know, they don't do rhymes like moon and June. Well, this song has moon and June rhyming. So, you know, maybe that's one reason they look down on it themselves, but it's really a nice tune. And uh, so I, I just had to include it. Because I, I kind of like the song, Despite the Moon in June, and it is, as I say, the only Lennon-McCartney BBC-only track. And this is the only performance of theirs that we have of it in any form. So mm. that's my 14. Yeah, you know, there's so many songs that Lennon-McCartney gave away to other artists that were quite good. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I happen to like most of them. And I'll Be On My Way could have worked for the Beatles, but it worked ra rather well for Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas. But, um, yeah, I could just as easily have heard the Beatles do this and, and release it on one of their early albums. In some ways, melodically, it kind of reminds me a bit of, like, uh, 
like tell me what you see <laughs> you know it's got more of a mccartney feel to it at least i think anyway that's just me but you can't go wrong with any of these choices alan and it is very difficult to whittle everything down to 14 and um really and truly that live at the bbc compilation that came out in 1994 was so good <laughs> the way they put it together the the cuts that they chose and the material that they chose and the performances in particular in my case when we do get to my 14 they're all from that compilation mm -hmm. i think most of mine were i think only one track came from the second compilation I can't remember yeah. which one it was maybe i'm talking about you yeah and one of the things that I wanted to mention is that the first two BBC appearances the Beatles made were with Pete Best. Mm -hmm. And the recordings that I've heard on bootleg are of lesser quality. You know, it's kind of off the radio with static. So if that matters at all to you in releasing this, what the sound quality will be, I can understand why you wouldn't want to include that. But at the same time, historically, you know, Mm -hmm. It might be very important to have something from the first BBC appearance. Well, you know, left totally to my own devices, I would release the 24-disc Lord Reith set, you know, just <laughs> complete, you know. Well, I wanted to make things difficult for you and Darren. So <laughs> just <worked>. realistically, <laughs> realistically, if this was the 60s and the record company said one album, 14 songs, I mean, that is a lot of material. When you think about it, the ba the Beatles gave you a lot for the money back in those days, you know. I mean, yeah. even though their albums were short, they still gave you fourteen songs compared to eleven or twelve here. So um, I'm very grateful when you when you learn the British catalog and you become used to the fourteen songs yeah. on every album. So uh, yeah, Darren, it is yes. your turn. Your turn. My turn. All right. Well, of course. I had to be a little different, and I accidentally, when picking my songs, I picked, uh, I guess it was close to being done, and I counted 15, and I'm like, uh-oh, and then ended up spending more time, wasting more time trying to figure out which one I would drop, and I decided, you know, there was one I was really thinking about adding. Why don't I add it and go with 16 songs? Now, if this album comes out in the 19, mid, saved by the mid-60s, it comes out in England, UK on Parlophone. Perhaps there was, there definitely would have been enough room to put eight songs on each side. I don't know exactly when into the logic of the 14 songs on a Beatles album, if it was a publishing deal or some sort of unwritten rule on how many tracks uh, could fit. Uh, and they would go with seven on each side. I went with eight, figuring the songs tended to be a touch shorter. Uh, and uh, eight per side would would fit comfortably, and I wasn't about to drop the extra song that I picked. So <laughs> I have eight per side, and like um, a couple of my picks came from the second BBC album. The majority of them, though, from the first. And um, the, my criteria was I could go digging around on the internet and try to find additional stuff that has not come out legally. Alan made mention of what the 24 disc bootleg bootlegs or whatever the case might be. I decided, you know what? These were the songs that were picked in, you know, the nineties and a few years ago for the BBC albums. I'll assume those are the cream of the crop. I'll go with those as the ones I'm going to pick from and uh, basically put together an album that I titled the Beatles best from the BBC. I thought with all the B's, that would actually make a nice visual for the album cover. The Beatles' Best from the BBC, a 16-song collection, collecting tunes that the Beatles did not commit to one of their own studio albums, which is kind of like what we're all doing, both, you know, all three of us, sticking right. to the tracks that, you know, aren't on the studio albums. So we, and as for running order, it's rather flexible. I didn't really spend too much time putting the tracks in any particular order except that i thought my album it would work good to open with some other guy which alan picked mm. uh originally done by richie barrett and lieber and stoller had a hand at writing that i thought that would make it that's one of my favorites you know of that early period of the uh material that didn't make it onto their regular studio albums i always liked some other guy 
So that's my opener. Side one, track one, some other guy. For the most part, the rest of these aren't necessarily in any particular order. I'll Be On My Way comes next. Mm -hmm. Um, As you mentioned, Alan picked it. Lennon McCartney tune. Billy J. Kramer with the Dakotas recorded it. My next tune then would be uh, yet another one that Alan picked. Sure to Fall in Love with You, uh, which was Carl Perkins tune. Crying, Waiting, Hoping is next. The Buddy Holly tune, another Alan choice. (laughs) Now, this one uh, Alan didn't pick. I'm going to sit right down and cry over you. Yeah. You didn't pick that, right, Alan? No. No. I'm going to sit right down and cry over you would be next. Uh, There's a bunch. I think it might be safe to assume of all the artists that they covered, uh, at least on the two BBC albums that came out, Chuck Berry has to be the one that, that they covered the most, I think. I didn't count, but... So I went with Johnny B. Good. I, went, I played it safe. I went with one of his more popular songs to put on side one of my album, Johnny B. Good, which which Alan picked. Mm. And then, uh, so How Come No One Loves Me mm. was the next uh, tune that I picked. And I actually neglected to write down any notes about this one. Uh, and finishing off side one, again, eight tracks with this song that you finished up with, Alan, uh, Don't Ever Change. The Jerry Goffin, Carol King tune. Very rare song. I don't think I realized how rare it was. The Crickets did it, and I think it was a B-side. It was uh, actually a, a top 10 single in the UK. This was well, this was after Buddy Holly passed away. This will learn you to listen to me. Um, <laughs> but other than that, uh, you know, the, the song didn't, you know, hasn't become one of the classic quintessential Jerry Goffin, Carol King tunes. Don't ever change. So that closes out side one of my album. On to side two. Lend Me Your Comb, another one in my book, sort of an essential early, you know, pre-Parlophone BBC track that I've always enjoyed. Mm -hmm. Um, And then Alan picked this one. The Hippie Hippie Shake is next. Chan Romero did that. Now, the next batch of songs that Alan didn't choose, Memphis, Tennessee, Mm -hmm. which he considered... Uh, didn't pick it i went with it that's all right mama uh and then nothing shaken nothing shaken he's on a train uh and then to ray charles i got a woman soldier of love first recorded by arthur alexander and closing out the album a song i always think about i always think how much paul was influenced by uh little richard little richard would have to be on the album a big exclamation point on my album with Lucille as the eighth and final song on side two. Uh, so that's my album, The Beatles Best from the BBC. Ba-da. Okay. Very nice. I think that the, the list that I came up with is kind of like a combination, a mixture of what the two of you came up with. And they're all great, great selections, no doubt about it. There's just so much good stuff to pick from. And easily, if you're thinking about the 36 songs, they did for bbc that they didn't release you could have made a double album out of all this oh yeah you know and going by american albums with 11 or 12 tracks you could have made three albums out of it (laughs) (laughs) uh it's just that the first couple of performances sound quality wise at least so far you know they're not uh high quality i mean the others are really pretty good for the most part and uh, I do believe that first compilation was like the cream of the crop, even though there's a few gems there on on the, the second one on air. But, um, yeah, real nice choices there, Darren. And um, I like the fact that, uh, you know, you, you tried to make sure you had some of that country music in there with Sure to Fall, which you both yeah. had. The, um, the, the one thing I couldn't do that I wanted was to include as an album at that time would have a Ringo song because... The only tunes that Ringo sang on the two legally released BBC albums, the songs we know, that's part of their recorded repertoire. Right. Yep, that's true. There's no way you can have Ringo with a lead vocal on this if you're going just by the songs they didn't release. Okay, so I'm going to read to you my 14 songs. And um, the first four songs were ones that I just wrote down automatically without even looking at any list, whichever ones just came to mind. Um, I knew that I had to include the first four, but um, this is in no particular sequence. This is just my 14 songs. 
All right. The first one is Soldier of Love, which I think, and certainly from all my years doing my radio show, it's the most requested of all the BBC material. And I really think that had it had been released maybe as a single of all the songs that they did for BBC radio, as much as I love all that other stuff, I think there's potential for that to have been a hit. I think it was just right the way it was, just perfect the way it was. Arthur Alexander song. I put into Nowhere is to Lover, which is one of my absolute favorites of all the BBC stuff. The harmonies on that are just absolutely wonderful. If ever I do a harmony set on my show, I try to include that one. That along with uh, a song like Yes It Is or This Boy or Because, they represent some of the best harmonies the Beatles have done in the studio. And to Nowhere is to Lover is just... It's a perfect recording, as are really, you know, all of these. By the time the Beatles were doing this stuff in 1963 on the radio, they were really hot as, as performers. You could tell that, you know, putting in all the hours in Hamburg in particular made them a really good live act to the point where they were ready in the studio. And these recordings really prove that. I'm not saying every single guitar solo was perfect from George, but it was pretty darn close. Also, I had to put Sweet Little 16 in there. And I think neither one of you chose that. But that is quite a rockin' song there of all the Chuck Berry stuff. And George's lead guitar work, the one that's on live at the BBC, I know they did it more than once, but that one's just smoking. I mean, I really think that's one of their best performances on BBC radio. I had to put Nothing Shaken But the Leaves on the Trees. That's such a great rock and country and western rockabilly feel to it and george's voice is so perfect for that as we know from his love of rockabilly and call perkins and all that really it's just it's such a fun recording nothing shaken also another one that neither one of you put in there was the honeymoon song Mm -hmm. which i really like a lot and paul is so great at the ballads and just like he was doing show music with till there was you or a taste of honey This is pretty much along the same lines, and he delivers it perfectly vocally. It's just tailor-made for him. He also did it later with Mary Hopkin for uh, her Postcard album. And I had to put in there, I'm going to sit right down and cry over you. That was a great rockin' performance, and in particular, it paid careful attention to Ringo's drumming, which is just fantastic Mm -hmm. on that particular song. I Got a Woman, I had to put in there. They very cleverly, on Live at the BBC, had that as one of the first few tracks. And it's like, man, does that light up (laughs) the collection to to start with that song or have it be one of the first songs there. Uh, You know, John's vocals are so great for, uh, in this case, Ray Charles or for Chuck Berry. And yeah, uh, they did more Chuck Berry than anybody else. And John's vocals are so perfect for Chuck. I'm not going to say he's the only one because... Hey, George said roll over Beethoven, but I Got a Woman is a great performance there. And sometimes, as much as I love the performance, the vocals can carry a song, which happens all the time with John, with a lot of John's vocals. Then I also put I Gotta Find My Baby, which is another Chuck Berry song, even though Chuck didn't write it, but it's another great performance there. So How Come No One Loves Me, I put in there as well. Again, very good. uh, I like having these songs with George on lead vocals, one of the things that you discover when you listen to the BBC recordings is that there's a lot more George vocals than you'd expect to hear. And in their early years, and this was also something Brian Epstein wanted to do, was to have George also be given some time, close to equal time, with the others when it came to lead vocals on stage. When it came time to having a record contract, since John and Paul wrote most of the material, it fell to them. So George ended up only singing cover songs and a couple Lennon McCartney songs, and then it only picked up as he wrote more material, but he never got to sing as many vocals as John and Paul. But in the early years, live and on the BBC, he got quite more out of George. And it's a real treat. It's one of the things that I love about listening to live at the BBC is that you hear so much more of George on lead vocals than you normally would. Also, I'll Be On My Way has to be on there, not just because it's a Lennon-McCartney, but because it's just, it's a good song. It's a solid song throughout. 
melodically, yeah, corny lyrics with Moon and June, but hey, it's the early 60s. <laughs> it's still, it, it's, it's valid. It's a good song. You know, it's good to give to anybody else. And if the Beatles had done it on one of their first couple of albums, I would have had no problem with it. I also put in there Youngblood. Mm-hmm. Youngblood, because the Beatles loved the coasters, as we know, when they did quite a number of coaster songs live and also on the deck audition recordings, you know, with Searchin and, uh, and what Three else? Cool cats. Three cool cats. Yeah. So this is a fun song and they're having a blast there, alternating vocals. You know, she's the one, all that bit. And it's, it's comical and it's fun to listen to. And then I think about, you know, George doing it at Bangladesh with Leon Russell. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, that was a great performance to itself. Leon was just amazing doing that one. And also I had to put in some other guy. I actually had, I just don't understand, but I took that out in favor of some other guy because it's such a great rocking performance there. And because of the, its, its significance also with the footage that we've seen of the Beatles at the Cavern doing it. And I also put in there, Don't Ever Change. Again, you know, nice pop song there, Goffin and King. And uh, I believe that's just George and Paul doing the harmonies on that. And the last one that I put was I Forgot to Remember to Forget. Also, because we all know how much they loved Rockabilly and in particular Elvis Presley's Sun Records. And that was one of the, the songs that he did for Sun. And uh, just like the performance of that and another George vocal. So those are my 14 that I put in there. And if I had any other uh, additional songs, honorable mentions, songs that almost made it, I would have included Johnny B. Good. Ooh, My Soul really is an exciting track. It's only like a minute and 30 seconds. Ringo really tears it up on drums towards the end. And probably Lucille, the one that's on, on air is kind of different only because the one that's on the first live at the BBC, the DJ talks over the intro. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want that (laughs) uh, on an actual release. Although the performance on the first one might be better as far as the guitar solo is concerned, but um, those would be my choices. So it is a shame in a way that they didn't take this opportunity in the sixties to do this, but it became something really fascinating to discover later on in the bootleg world. And um, we're also happy that they released those two CD compilations. Although, you know, I always hear Alan's voice telling me it should be the complete set. Mm-hmm. So there you go. Yeah, I mean, when the first compilation came out, I reviewed it in the Times and um, compared it negatively to the bootlegs just because the bootlegs were, you know, always strived for, for completeness or strove for completeness Mm -hmm. and that was at the time the radioactive set was out and uh there was an italian set as well i can't remember i can't remember the name it wasn't bulldog um but you know it was a boxed set that had pretty much you know most of what what we knew existed at the time and i thought you know bootleggers can do this so can capital (laughs) you know (laughs) um you mean great dane Great Dane, yes, that was it. It was okay. a dog. I knew it was a dog. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was a, that was a good set, and uh, and that didn't come out that you know long before the the first official set. So I found the first official set a little you know I was happy it was out. I was thrilled that it was out, and that Soldier of Love was now available to everyone, and you know some of those other tracks, but. But I was was disappointed that it was only really, from my point of view, excerpts from the, you know, whole BBC catalog. I, I, I thought the whole thing should come out. Still do. Hmm. I actually was the um, album that um, this was the last album I listened to uh, as a single man. The day I got married, um, I had just received a promo. It wasn't coming out yet, and it was. I think the next week it was going to be out in the U.S. And I was listening to it as I was getting ready to go to my wedding. <laughs> and then once we were in England on our honeymoon, this is with my wife, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, I hope so. <laughs> we had rented 
car, I mean, the, the, it was a two week, two weeks in England. We rented a car uh, and basically it was basically London to Wales to Liverpool. I spent about, I think, uh, 30 seconds behind the wheel and nearly drove into a pole in one of those roundabouts. My wife told me to get out and uh, I didn't go behind the wheel again the rest of the uh, honeymoon. But uh, one thing I picked up while there, because vinyl was was virtually non-existent here, I was stunned when walking in a record store in London to find live at the BBC on vinyl all over the place, whereas here in the U.S. it didn't exist. It might have somewhere if you looked under a, a, a corner somewhere in the Tower Records, but uh, mm. I, I bought it on LP in, in, in England and picked it up on cassette, uh, and I had it uh, and spent a lot of time playing it in the car as we drove between the hedgerows in Wales. Mm-hmm. Was there a bustle in the hedgerow? There, yeah, there was a lot of bustles. Uh, uh, nothing worse than driving when you're from the Bronx, driving in Wales at night. Mm. When all there are are walls of bushes on either side. No, they're hedgerows, Darren. They're bushes in the Bronx, and I can't see anything else. We're the only people left on Earth. There was another funny thing about the... Um, I was thinking about you know the review I did for the Times is that my editor decided to illustrate it with the covers of bootlegs, which um, didn't really please Capital that much. And it turned out that he, in, in the morning when he came into the office, he came in from New Jersey where the publicist from Capital also lived and also was on the same bus. And she walked up to him and said, you know, that review was, re- it's really unfair to assign these things to Alan because he knows the stuff. Now, if you think about that, <laughs> You know, <laughs> reviews should only be assigned to people who don't know the stuff. Is that the deal? Mm. <laughs> but, yeah. No, it shouldn't go to someone that knows what the possibilities could be if it was any better. Mm. Right. Right. But, uh, you know, I know that you were disappointed that, like in the case of these compilations, that it didn't have the full bantering in the studio and with the DJ Mm -hmm. it was edited down but at least it did have some of that and it showed their sense of humor but I'm also thinking you know in the 60s how well would that have been received if you had talking on the record as well as the music yeah for this compilation I mean I don't know we didn't really talk about this as a parameter but I was thinking of it as being all without the dialogue you know, mm-hmm. I mean, for a complete BBC thing, I would want the, all the dialogue. But, you know, for a 14 track album that's just showing the best of the BBC stuff, um, I, I'm just going with the songs. That's why also, you know, you said with um, one of the Lucille's, I think, uh, that on one of them, the DJ talks over the beginning. Uh, right. With one of the tracks that I ended up eliminating, but did some comparisons of the two sets, uh, was uh, Memphis. And um, one of the Memphises had some talking and one of them didn't. Um, mm. I ended up eliminating it. If I was going to do what Darren did and had 16 tracks, what I might have done is kept the Memphis with a little bit of John talking at the end because he says, and another thing. And then I would have gone into Happy Birthday, which they did next because it was the Saturday Club's birthday show and hey having the Beatles do happy birthday that's kind of a kick you know it might not have been as good a choice as Lucille or something but you know if I included Memphis I would have included those two tracks connected by John's comment yeah it also would have been nice to have the the Crimble medley (laughs) right yeah (laughs) which is which is pretty unique for itself to do a real short medley of their hits at the time and then just yell out Crimble yeah. You know, I think the Crimble medley technically and, and Happy Birthday are not counted among the 36. So it went away. There's 38. I suppose. <laughs> All right. They also recorded or, or performed Sheila, the Tommy Rowe song mm-hmm. early on. But I think it wasn't recorded. Otherwise, well, it would have turned up somewhere. You would have hoped. It's not because on the Hamburg are- set? The, on the Hamburg, what? No, that, I'm talking about at the BBC. Oh, oh, hmm. I don't know. No, early that. on they did they did the song Sheila, but I've never heard the BBC recording of that. 
I'm not sure they did. We'll have to look in the Kevin Howlett book when we get off, I guess. But um, mm-hmm. hmm. Yeah, actually, I have it right up here online. Uh, Michelle, here we go, which was their third uh, BBC appearance. They did the song Sheila. This is October 25th of 1962. Hmm. But that hasn't surfaced anywhere that no. I know of. No. Hmm. We'll have to get out there and overturn some stones and see what we can find. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but the BBC stuff is just something that I really treasure, especially that first compilation, because uh, so many songs there that they didn't end up releasing for EMI. Sometimes I wonder the choices that they made for EMI of the songs they covered. They could have easily have done any of these other songs, but yet they picked the ones that they did, you know. Maybe some of us might have preferred a sweet little 16 over, I don't know, Honey Don't or something like that. Or Mr. Moonlight, which is the one that everybody picks on. But, uh, yeah, so it's just nice to have all this other material and to hear what a great live band they were in the studio, you know, in 1963. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of these tracks, you know, by this time in the time in 63, they were doing them for the BBC. They were already sort of, they were already out of the live set. You know, the live set was now only, you know, half an hour long and it was, uh, you know, the stuff that they were recording for EMI. And, uh, my, my feeling, and I could be wrong. My feeling was that, um, since they were going on the BBC so much, didn't, first of all, didn't want to play the same songs every week, which, you know, their their current live set would have exhausted pretty quickly. Um, but mm. I also think, uh, you know, maybe uh, it, in some corner of their minds, collective mind, they were thinking, you know, we can't record all this stuff for EMI, we might as well document it somehow, you know, and they were no longer playing them live, so I think they were just giving them sort of a, a last hurrah, you know, and uh, and also getting them out there, getting them down, having people hear them, giving people a, a broader sense of what they could do beyond what you heard on the LP. Yeah, I hope they were thinking that, Yeah, because they could have just as easily have gone the other route and just say, we're only going to do the songs that are on our album so we can help sell the albums more. Yeah. They could have easily have done that. So, so I many reasons. If, I wonder if, yeah. if they had done that, you know, and gone on every week playing the same three or four songs, uh, if, if the BBC would have had them back so often, given them their own, you know, Pop Go the Beatles show, stuff like that. I think, mm. the, I think the fact that they had a big repertory really uh, was a good selling point for them with the BBC. Good point. Any final thoughts, Darren? <laughs> uh, no, final thoughts, no. I actually really don't have any. You guys beautifully touched on all, you know. I was just sitting back listening to uh, what you had to say. So that's, I guess, all, you know, I don't have any uh, anything else to add. All right, then. Why don't we go around the table here and give uh, our listeners our contact info, starting with you, Darren. Alrighty. Um, if you want to send me an email uh, directly, you can send it to my WFUV email address, which is Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org. You can go to Facebook. I have two pages. One is just Darren DeVivo, and you can send me a friend request. I'm probably going to ask you, how do you know me? Just, you know, hey, I listen to the podcast. And the other websites, uh, of, of the website, the other Facebook page is a, um, is a page. It's not a personal page. It's uh, my uh, group, whatever they call these things on Facebook, Darren DeVivo, WFUV DJ, Beatles podcaster, writer. So you could uh, like that page and send me a friend request. We'll be covered. Uh, you have the email address, and uh, you can listen to me on WFUV Monday through Thursday nights at 10 p.m. and Saturday afternoons from 1 to 4, and that's 90.7 FM in the New York City metropolitan area. Uh, if you still tune into eight on HD, we're at 90.7 FM HD two. stream us at WFUV.org. Listen on our app and uh, just listen, however you do it. All right. Very good. Alan, your turn. Okay. You can reach me on Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, you can send email to all of us um, collectively at 
things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. That's things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. We also have a Twitter feed, which is at things we said fab. And we have two group Facebook pages. The main one is Things We Said Today Beatles Radio Fans. And there is also one that's just Things We Said Today. Um, the show gets posted on both of them. You can feel free to comment there or on our YouTube and Podbean versions. I think um, both allow comments. I know YouTube definitely does. And don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube if you haven't already. And I think that's that. All right. Before I give everybody my contact information and what's going on with me, I just want to take the time to thank everyone that wrote to us um, in response to our last two shows, especially the one that we did on why the early Beatles music doesn't chart uh, in America. And if, apparently it's that way as far as I know, and the rest of the world. And we got a tremendous response to that. Read some of the comments on YouTube. I love hearing uh, everyone's different opinions on this. And um, yeah, everybody has their own ideas as to why that is. And um, it's something that has baffled me for, for quite some time. And if it wasn't something that was a new occurrence, like I said, uh, I first attempted doing a show on, on this uh, a good 10 years ago and it's still the same it's like the only music from the beatles that appears on the charts is from 1967 on except for the one album where you do have early music but we did get a great response to that and i deeply appreciate all the comments that you've you sent us on youtube and elsewhere some people have written to me to my private email but thanks to all of you and um you know it's a great topic that hopefully we'll revisit again and thanks to everybody that wrote about David Bedford's appearance here uh, for the country of Liverpool, his new book. If you want to get in touch with me directly, my email is everylittlething at att.net. And I want to make sure I mention that my YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, I've been quite busy on it of late. There's three brand new interviews with Gary Van Syok the bass player of Elephant's Memory, covering just about everything you can think to ask of Gary and the period when Elephant's Memory backed up John and Yoko, the Sometime in New York City album, Yoko's Approximately Infinite Universe album, and the one and only Elephant's Memory album on Apple, which John produced, the TV appearances, the one-to-one -one concert. I just did an interview with David Bedford, you know, to follow up on the one that he did with us. If you want to hear more from David, uh, talking about country music in Liverpool, the influence on the Beatles, more of that. Uh, it's on my YouTube page, Ken Michaels Radio. I did one other thing on the YouTube page. I interviewed Jeff Slate, who's a good friend to all of us. He's a New York musician. He not only has recorded his own material, but very frequently uh, does tributes to George Harrison, John Lennon, David Bowie, Tom Petty. And he's a music journalist that's written for everybody from Beatle fan to Rolling Stone to um, NBC News. You name it. We did a show on George Harrison to time with his birthday. And I developed this new concept for a show called Number Nine Dream, which basically is soliciting nine answers from my guest in groups of three. And I ask my guests to name their top three of something. So in this particular case, it's Jeff's top three George Beatles songs, top three George solo songs, top three George solo albums. So it gives me nine answers in the course of that show. So once in a while, I'll be doing that with a guest. I'll pick a specific Beatle and we'll do top threes of something. It doesn't always have to be those same three categories, but it's a real fun idea. And uh, no doubt, you know, I might have Darren or Alan on the show talking about that. There goes the neighborhood. <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, I'm going to invite uh, everyone that I know and uh, from my other podcasts as well to do the same thing. But uh, look for that on my YouTube page, especially if after the guest name, it says number nine dream. That's what the show is all about. So, you know, like I said, it's top three of things could be if I'm doing a Lennon show, top three, John vocals, you know, it doesn't have to be songs even, our albums. It's whatever we feel like picking. 
So that's on my YouTube page. Please subscribe to that. And the next Talk More Talk will be Monday on March the 8th. We're going to be uh, talking about the Fireman albums. And Ken Womack, our frequent co-host, will be joining us for that show. And you can pick us up live on our Facebook page, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast at 9 p.m. Eastern Eastern. next Monday. And you can type in comments as the show goes out. And then it later uh, stays on YouTube. And please subscribe to that page as well. Okay. And don't forget my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com, Beatles Trivia, interviews on there. And that's about it. Okay. So this has been a great show talking about the Beatles at the Beeb and putting together our own dream BBC compilation. What would be yours? Please write to us about this. What would you put with all this great material? If you had a choice of 14 songs, what would you put on a BBC uh, compilation if it was the 60s? Okay. Let us know. So thanks so much to all of you for listening. And for Darren DeVivo and Alan Cozen, I'm Ken Michaels saying thanks for joining us. And we will see you next time. Take care.